Good afternoon, everyone, or perhaps good morning, or even good evening, depending on where you are, and welcome to this edition of PON Live. Today, the program on negotiation is delighted to present this event in celebration of The Power of Experiments, the latest work from Harvard Business School professors Michael Luca and Max Bazerman, in a conversation moderated by one of their colleagues, Deepak Malhotra. My name is Nicole Bryant, and I am the Managing Director of the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. The Program on Negotiation is a consortium of Harvard University, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Tufts University. And at PON, we work to help people solve problems, build successful relationships, and deal productively with conflict. And we are delighted to have this series of virtual events where we're able to host so many members of our community from all around the world, and I know that people are already and will continue to be putting where they're showing up from in the chat. Thank you. We love it. We love to see you here um, and, uh, and be able to convene so many folks uh, from wherever you are. Now, we will have about 40 minutes for discussion today and then about 20 minutes of questions and answers. So when you have a question uh, for our speakers, please do use the Q&A function at the bottom of the chat. This is a really handy function on Zoom that allows your fellow participants to upvote questions in case they have the same one that you do. And of course, if you have comments at any point in time, please go ahead and put it in the chat. Uh, the wonderful PON staff will be happy to respond. Uh, and I'd like to thank them for all of their hard work in getting this event set up today, especially Anna Chang and Diane Long. And with that, I am delighted to introduce our three illustrious faculty members. Uh, I'm not going to go into a great detail of biography because if I did that, we would have no time left for discussion and Q&A. I will say that uh, they form a triangle of business school professors, co-authors, and negotiation experts. And gentlemen, I'm so delighted that you can be with, here with us today, and I'm really looking forward to this discussion. The Zoom mic is yours. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, thank you also to PON and the staff at PON who make uh, things like this possible for all of us to get together, uh, not just with people that we know, but with uh, a wide variety of people from around the world who are joining us here for this event. Uh, thanks also to all of you who are joining for the Zoom event, because I know there's a lot going on. Uh, in life, at work, uh, you have a lot of options for who you want to listen to because now everything is available online. And the fact that so many of you are interested in this, I think, is a testament uh, both to the guests that we have here, Max Bazerman and, and Mike Luca, two of my uh, close colleagues, but also to the kind of people that are in the audience who are looking for new ideas and ways to be better at their job uh, and all the ways in which they try to navigate the world around them. So with that, uh, let me just spend a quick moment uh, introducing uh, Max and Mike as the authors of The Power of Experiments, a great book that came out just a few months ago. Some of you in the audience may have read it, and if you have questions based on having read the book, those are, of course, also welcome. Uh, but we also want to have this conversation targeted to the many of you who are curious about it, but maybe don't know enough about either the content or whether it's applicable to you, so you can get a better sense of the ideas of this book. And my hope is that the discussion that we have both early on and through the Q&A will be the kind of discussion that gives you some immediate take home value. Uh, and if you want even more and you think it's right for you, you can of course uh, get more from the book or other things that Max and Mike have written. And I'll try to keep my job as simple as possible, which is to just throw ideas and questions out at Max and Mike to engage with and see what they have to say and what they can share with you about their perspective, about their research, about the work they've done with companies and governments around the world on leveraging the power of experiments. So with that, I'm gonna open it up just to sort of lay the foundation with a sort of straightforward question, which is uh, Mike and Max, uh, can you tell us a little bit about why you wrote this book and what problem you were trying to solve by putting out the power of experiments? Sure. So this is a topic that Max and I have been talking about for several years now. Uh, both of us have run a lot of experiments in our own research. Uh, and the thing that had struck us, and it's something that had come up in some of our MBA classes as well, is that experiments are no longer just a tool for academic researchers to write papers, although that is still a major use case of experiments, but it's also being used increasingly in companies. So when we set out to write the book, our motivation was that we had seen a number of technical how-to style guides around experiments, but what we didn't see is a managerial toolkit to help companies and governments to understand how can they bring experiments into their organizations, and for those that are already running experiments, how can they get more out of them? 
Um, and for me, I, it, it, there's this kind of this fascinating evolution in the last dozen years where we've seen experiments which used to be primarily based in laboratories move quickly into the field. And um, I have a long history as a laboratory experimentalist and there's um, a growing group of uh, fantastic psychologists and economists um, who tend to be significantly younger than me, like Mike, um, who are doing amazing things as experiments have left the laboratory and headed into the field. And, um, and I think Mike and I would um, talk as we talk together about kind of this fascinating evolution of the field. Um, so for me, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of a fan of all these field experiments that are happening that are featured in the, in the book. Um, and um, it was just kind of a treat to be able to document this along with Mike. It, 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 sort of this evolution also happened as we were teaching field courses together for um, Harvard MBA students and Harvard um, um, HKS students getting their master's degrees who were working on a variety of field projects. So we got to experience what it was like to enter this field um, with a passion to develop um, a true understanding of what causes positive change in organizations and what are the challenges of doing work that allows us to reach the right conclusions. You're on mute, Deepak. Eventually we'll solve that problem. I think by the time the next pandemic hits, I'll have this yeah. now. Uh, you mentioned documenting what's been going on and seeing this evolution and seeing the movement from lab to the field. But what's, what's really interesting about the book is that in addition to documenting what's been going on, which in itself is educational and inspiring, I think you, you point to a lot of the things that people still get wrong. You also document the kinds of mistakes people make even when they have good intentions in wanting to run experiments and better understand how to make their organizations better. Can you tell us a little bit about the kinds of mistakes you see people making that people in the audience might, might benefit from as well? Some of the motivation around understanding these mistakes came from research projects that we had been involved in um, in various ways over time. Um, and part of the motivation for that was uh, my own background is more on in, in the tech sector where I've looked at the design of online platforms, looking at places like Airbnb and Yelp. We also have uh, work in there where we discuss experiments being run by eBay, by StubHub, by Amazon, Google, and others. And these are areas where they're actually running lots of experiments. So there are tech companies that are running tens of thousands of experiments. But we were also struck by kind of the big blind spots that uh, companies could sometimes have, even when they are trying to be data-driven. Uh, so to give just one example, uh, a lot of times, you'll see that there's a narrow focus of an experiment. So take Airbnb, for example, they have been running thousands of experiments a year, trying to optimize to short run growth on the platform, like kind of bookings um, of rentals. And uh, my collaborators and I, so this is with uh, Ben Edelman and Dan Sversky, I've been looking at that and said, well, you know, the fact that they're experimenting with a very narrow set of outcomes means that they may be missing other uh, other factors that are going to be important for them in the long run. And one uh, that we have been looking at was the fact that some of the design choices they made uh, left the platform open for risk that there would be discrimination on the platform. So we ran our own experiment looking at discrimination on the platform. We presented the results to them and published the paper on this. And as a result of this, uh, there was a series of policy discussions and, and discussions within Airbnb about what went wrong and how they could fix it. Um, and there's lots that we could go into there, but just one thing that I wanted to highlight, and I think this is kind of a lesson that they took away from it, is that they now have a team that's dedicated to looking at discrimination of the platform and experiments. So they're now taking a broader view of what does it mean for a product change or a policy change to be a success. So I think kind of this narrow set of goals is one type of thing that could go wrong. Um, I could dive into more or we could get more into that. So I, I would take kind of almost the flip side of what Mike said. So, you know, so Mike is, uh, has done a great job in our book, um, but also in independent papers, um, talking about um, sort of key ingredients for doing wise experimentation in the field, as well as mistakes that, um, that many organizations have made. Um, I think another big mistake is that organizations have failed to 
appreciate the power of experiments. And um, in our book tries to highlight the fact that many people like the idea of trying new ideas. They think it's good to think systematically. They think it's good to look at the data. Um, it's good to compare the new idea to the old idea. And when you put those things together, the best way to do those things is often to run what we think of as a true experiment, which doesn't mean try something out and see how it works, but running a clinical trial, kind of like we think um, uh, in the pharmaceutical world where some people get the drug, some people get the placebo, and we can find out whether or not um, the chemicals in the drug actually matter. Um, and getting more and more executives to be aware of the benefit of what you might think of an experimental mindset of the idea of trying things and trying them systematically, um, I think highlights one of the key opportunities. Um, you could call it a mistake of what people have done in the past, um, but there's all kinds of good ideas that people haven't done in the past. Um, and we think that this book can help bring more people into the world of thinking systematically with an experimental mindset. So, so Max, that was really helpful because one of the, the comments that came into the chat uh, just a moment ago, and maybe you saw it as well, and perhaps you were uh, addressing it, was to just be a little bit clear about what we do and don't mean by the use of the word experiments. And, and you made a great point that, yes, we could use it more generally as in having sort of an experimental mindset and trying different things. But here, a lot of what we're focusing on is being rigorous and being systematic and having conditions that you can compare in a more precise way to decide which approach is, is more effective. Is that right? That's right. And, and, and I, I don't mean to criticize um, people for trying new things when they can't do it as, as systematically as possible. But if we think about um, a new drug coming on the market, okay, um, or a new COVID um, related product, vaccine or otherwise, the FDA requires us or, or, or the similar licensing agencies in other countries to run tests to see whether or not that they work. And these tests are um, true clinical trials or randomized control trials or A-B testing, whichever term you like. These are all words for the roughly the same thing um, because um, the, the FDA in the US case has suggested that we're not comfortable with a new drug just because a, pharma, a pharmaceutical firm says, trust us, we, we, test, we tried it out on 10 people and they liked it. Um, we want better data than that. And there are many things that we do in life that aren't pharmaceutical products where we could have access to better data by being more systematic, by thinking about having a control um, condition. Um, often all we're talking about is before you implement an idea throughout the entire country. Do you wanna try it out on 10,000 people and have the right comparison group so that we actually know what works? And uh, the conversation has moved a little bit in, in a direction that I find kind of uh, interesting, especially for the audience that we have here, because uh, some people will look uh, for this book specifically. They know they wanna run experiments, they've already been running experiments and they're trying to figure out how to do it better and which mistakes to avoid. There's others who might not have been thinking about it exactly in that way, but they'll see the book cover or they'll read the blurb and they immediately know this is the kind of book that they need to use. I think the most interesting group always, as far as an audience is concerned from a, from a book perspective is the kind of person who maybe doesn't realize they could get value from it. So they never end up picking up the book. Only when they read it, do they come up with all these opportunities and learnings that they can then apply in their own life and in their own workplace. And I want to talk a little bit about what might be in this book for that audience who doesn't immediately see it and isn't uh, automatically using these ideas on some level and they just want to sort of tool up. And I'm reminded of something that Mike uh, had mentioned to me about a guest that he was going to have in his class uh, recently. Uh, Mike, tell us about uh, the CEO who, who walked into your class who had not run an experiment before and a little bit about how, how that uh, came to be and, and what came of it. 
Yeah, so this came from a conversation I was having with the CEO of a large chain of coffee shops. So they had several hundred outlets, they had a few thousand baristas. And actually, uh, when we were chatting, initially experiments were not top of mind for the person. He had a business problem that he was trying to solve. And the problem he was struggling with is he had wanted to improve the work environment for his employees. He kind of had this idea that if you could help provide life skills training to employees, that would help them both at work help them feel more connected to work and help them just have overall better satisfaction. So they had a set of surveys they were doing and they rolled out this program and he found that employees weren't really taking it up. So we were chatting about kind of why are people taking it up? Uh, what's going on there? And he highlighted a couple of things. It wasn't clear to people that the program, or it wasn't clear to the, to the, outlets to each store that the program would be valuable to their employees. They said, maybe it will. And he felt like he knew it would be, but he didn't have any hard evidence to show it. And it wasn't clear how you could encourage people to take it uh, without any more information. And when I heard him describing this, this kind of screams experiments to people who have been working in this world, because you just look at this and say, well, you've got lots of different employees. You're not sure uh, what the barriers are for them taking it. You have the ability to randomize what messages you give them. And this could help give you the credible evidence you're looking for. And I said to him, look, you may be confident. That doesn't mean that everybody else is confident that this program is going to be as effective as you think. And he sort of agreed with that and said, well, if it isn't, I would want to know that too, because then I could change my tack for how do I create a good workplace culture. And the, he came into my class and the whole class just brainstormed on how can you start to use an experiment to help answer this question. And the type of thing we started thinking about is you could run an experiment to encourage a subset of employees to take the program, but not roll that out to everybody else initially. And what that would tell you is you could track the outcomes for those employees relative to everybody else, and you could see exactly what the value of the program is. And at the same time, that could help you to understand what are the types of messages or facts that would help to encourage people to take it. And, and uh, as I understand it, they're now starting to roll this out. Uh, this just happened a couple of weeks ago, maybe. Uh, but it sort of screams the question, well, you know, he's the CEO of this company. Well, why does he need to run an experiment to, to convince anybody? Why can't he just sort of impose it uh, on the employees? Yeah, so it's a great it's a great question, and I, this question that even comes up even when you do have formal authority. But this was an interesting uh, situation where the shops are all uh, franchises, so these were franchise owners, and he had no direct authority to force people to take the program. However, he did have other tools, like he could send out messages to them. He could try to uh, essentially kind of have a negotiation over who should be taking it, why they should be taking it, and the roadblock that they had run into is just the credible evidence. And this is something we talk about in the book, that one thing that experiments could do is help you to bring cre credible evidence to the table, whether you're in a negotiation or whether you're just trying to communicate with customers, uh, mm -hmm. that could allow you to do something more credibly. So without that formal authority, he thought this was a great opportunity for him to say, let me get some data and hard evidence that will either change my mind or change their mind. But either way, it'll stop this roadblock that we've been sitting on for the last several months. It actually, you're, that story feels connected to um, a story that we tell in the book, which was adapted um, from Mike's case on the behavioral insights team in the UK. So as some, some of the folks listening, watching know, um, a critical development in the history of field experiments was um, when uh, David Halpern and Owen Service created the behavioral insight team or the NUG unit. Um, under the Cameron government uh, a little bit more than a decade ago. Um, and um, they were brought into, you know, they were, they created a unit of government to use behavioral insights and experiments to make government work better. And one of the interesting parts of the evolution of this organization was the first experiment that they ran was on how to get people who weren't paying their taxes to pay their taxes. And they quickly um, demonstrated a mechanism for collecting an extra 80 million pounds. Um, and it turns out when you collect 80 million pounds that uh, the government wouldn't have had otherwise, people start paying attention. So they went from trying to convince people of the merits of experiments to having government agencies throughout um, the UK government knocking on their door saying, how about helping us solve problems of education, health, et cetera. <clears throat> In their, that basic model, 
has now spread across the globe as there are now literally hundreds of behavioral insight teams within government alone. And obviously there are um, a similar, there's similar growth in the tech sector as Mike suggested, but the ability to demonstrate um, the effectiveness of your idea, rather than just saying, I think it worked based on the 10 people I talked to, um, provides an enormous opportunity to diffuse your ideas. And, and uh, having been the uh, recipient of this, uh, you know, I'm on a board of a company where one of the things that often happens in our board meetings now, because this company is very much into experiments. So anytime one of the, the board members says, well, why aren't you doing it this way? You should really do it this way. I'm pretty sure this would be a better way. The number of times they respond was actually, we kind of been doing that test. And, and here's what happened when we reached out to folks in this way. It, it's, it's really compelling because what would have otherwise been a very lengthy discussion argument with everybody's views, perspective, experience. It worked for me when I did it in this company. In my experience, this is a better way of doing it. These folks have taken just uh, really to, to, to going in there and saying, well, you know what, maybe I'm right. Maybe you're right. Let's just find out which one it is. And I think it's much better uh, from that point of view when you can pull it off. Can you, can you tell us about other situations where it ends up playing a role in these sort of internal organizational negotiations uh, or with other stakeholders of an organization where you're trying to to sort of find the right way forward and the experiments can be leveraged in a sense to adjudicate what the right way might be or to convince somebody of somebody uh, something that otherwise might be more difficult. And so we have a chapter in the book that's a great example of this looking at eBay. And the interesting thing about eBay is that they were already running lots of experiments but there were some areas of the company where they weren't running any experiments. So they have been spending about $50 million a year advertising on Google. And they came out in discussions among the executive teams that, that there, there was uncertainty about how effective this advertising strategy was. And the marketing team sort of felt, look, we've been doing this, we're marketers, we know what we're doing, this, this stuff works. And another team, an economics team, and also a finance team said, well, it would be nice to get, get some other evidence for how effective things are that you've been doing. So uh, finally, after some discussions, the marketing team initially didn't want that because not every, like any innovation, not every part of the company um, is going to want to adapt it, adopt it initially. And so there was some discussion about whether to run an experiment. So they ran the experiment experiment and found that the money that they were spending on experiments was largely wasted. That uh, experiments that, or the, the money that they were spending on advertisements were largely wasted. So the $50 million a year uh, basically had very little effect on uh, traffic coming into eBay. And the problem is they had looked at how many people were clicking through, but they didn't look at what those people would have done in the absence of the advertisement. And that's the reason that you need a proper control group because they were getting a lot of people coming in who are searching for eBay and would have got into eBay whether or not there was an advertisement. So mm -hmm. in the wake of this, there were a couple of lessons learned in the company. So one is just about, should you be advertising on your brand or how should you be advertising? Should you be spending that much? Uh, but a couple, a second lesson that I thought was interesting is that they actually took this as an opportunity to say, hey, maybe we should be experimenting more in this part of the organization. So they actually started testing other types of ads on other platforms and creating a more experimental approach around their marketing strategy more broadly. Yeah, but it was an area where there was an internal negotiation up front about should they even be running this experiment. And then once they ran it, it helped to understand the value of ads, but also was a demonstration of the value of experimentation. Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting because uh, one of the things that both of you have said in, in various places, in, uh, obviously in the book as well, is that uh, you know, experiments don't simply need to be understood by, uh, technically uh, by data scientists or the group or the silo in your organization that is specifically responsible for a particular activity like advertising. Uh, or online advertising, but that executives and other leaders and even other people in different parts of the organization need to have some ownership and understanding of how experiments work, the power of experiments. Uh, can, you, can you say a little bit more about that, the, the need to sort of broaden the extent to which people understand these dynamics and, under, and how deeply does an executive or a leader or a manager in an organization need to get experiments other than sort of, yeah, you know, we should run experiments. So you can tell somebody, hey, listen, come to me with some results. Uh, is it more than that? And, and what do people actually need? 
Yeah. So when I think of the two meta mistakes that we kind of saw when we were going into the book, one was just not running experiments where you should be running experiments. So that's the, um, hey, we should have been doing this all along. I just haven't been. And the second is you see a lot of organizations that have teams of uh, data scientists or people running experiments that are sort of siloed off from the executive decision making. And this is where a lot of things can go wrong. Uh, and what part of our mission in the book was to understand what are the managerial questions that you should be thinking about? And what do you need to know about experiments, which is slightly different from what a data scientist might need to know. But to just give one example of where things could go wrong, if you have managers who aren't thinking enough about experiments, uh, I was in a meeting with some executives at a company who were talking about hiring. And we were thinking about a project where you could uh, improve the effectiveness of hiring and also looking at how they could ensure a more diverse uh, work step. Um, I asked them if they had data on GPAs and grades of employees that have been there. And, and the head of um, so the head of a large part of the organization said to me, "You know, we don't track um, we don't track grades. I don't think we have it. If if we wanted to look at grades, we would only want to use it to make sure that there's not a relationship between grades and hiring decisions." And I was like, well, why, why wouldn't you want to use uh, GPA or grades in trying to determine who you should or shouldn't hire? And then he looked at me and he said, well, Google proved that grades don't matter. And I looked at that and I, I just kind of had a jaw to the floor moment because I was thinking, one, I'd want to know a lot more as and not as kind of a data scientist or an experimentalist. But if I'm making that managerial decision, I'd want to know a lot more about what exactly Google did, because if you think about it, the people who have lower grades and still got the job at Google probably got the job because they were better at something else. So there's a lot of risk if all they're doing, and maybe they're doing more, but if all they're doing is looking at the different performance of people who are, uh, who are hired with different grades, then you'd start yeah, yeah, to worry yeah. off the bat. But then the second issue that came up is, you know, what if you're not thinking enough about why something worked or why that happened, you're going to miss whether or not that actually is relevant for your organization, which is going to have a different set of problems. So um, in, in the experimental world, and I think it's an important thing for managers to think about, is how does that insight generalize to the problem that we're thinking about here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, Max, you want to jump in on that one? Yeah. So, so I think that there's... Um kind of a fascinating um, dichotomy between people who think experimentally and those who just don't or even resist. So obviously, um, lots of us in academia think about experiments in, in systematic ways. And those of us who do, one of the interesting things is that we're not all that confident about specific effects that we have found. We, we know that we need to replicate. We know that we need to show that it generalizes to different contexts. Um, at the University of Pennsylvania, Katie Milkman and Angela Duckworth run a group called the uh, Behavioral Change for Good Project. And they're in the business of identifying a context, like getting people to go to the gym, getting people to take their vaccine, um, where they will run literally dozens of experiments simultaneously with lots of different people's ideas, where all, all of the professors, many of them quite well-known people, put their ideas to the test almost in a competitive way, knowing that we have ideas from behavioral science about what might work. But if we have a new question, how to get people to get their COVID vaccination, we don't know for sure what will work. And if we can learn the answer to that quickly, that can potentially save thousands of lives. And while academics often have this notion of experiments can be valuable and we're humble about what we know, there's another industry which is shockingly not humble and shockingly not experimental, not focused on experiments. And I'm, and I'm thinking of the consulting industry. So the consulting industry is a booming industry um, in the world. Um, and the consulting industry often charges clients um, a very large amount of money. And um, consult, uh, the large consulting firms know that behavioral insights, behavioral economics are in vogue. So they sort of claim that, that they have a unit on this topic. But then 
they don't encourage their clients to test their recommendations. So there are far, far too many consultants who make recommendations without any notion of having their client test whether or not their idea is a good one. Um, and there's too many clients who seek advice without asking the question, how would we find out quickly whether or not your advice is good? So I think that a con sort of a consulting firm that had an experimenting uh, mentality can certainly provide greater value. And I think that a client who demanded um, a sort of analytic plan for figuring out how will we know if your advice is good can create a far more effective transmission of knowledge from experts to app to specific applications. So, uh, so <coughs> that's interesting. So there's there's two things that that you almost implicitly uh, pitted against each other. Uh, and I'm now curious what your take on this is. And I'm not suggesting there is like one right answer, but maybe the two of you can weigh in on this. Um, do you think the people that have more of an experimental mindset and are more likely to pursue that approach to solving problems, uh, you would say are smarter than those that don't? Or is it that they're more humble than others? Uh, or and, and and the reason I ask this is not because it has to be a horse race, because what I'm, I'm really trying to do is, is catalog the barriers that might exist when you're trying to convince someone that they should run in, because uh, one of the questions that was already coming in was, how do you convince your boss to do this? How do you, what's standing in the way? Is it they're not trained? Is it that they're not intellectually as rigorous? Is it they're not as humble? Is it there's something else? So I, so I, I wouldn't claim smarter. Um, I, I might say humble. Um, and, and I'd say aware of um, the limitations of generalizing ideas from one context to another. And realizing that um, it's, very, it's very tempting to become overconfident with your favorite idea. So if, you're, if you work in a consulting firm to think that your tool can solve all problems or for an academic to think that my, my last publication can answer the world's problems, um, it's just very easy to be overconfident about the generalizability of results. And I think that um, we've seen enough problems in, in uh, the social sciences to, in, to increase the degree to which we're humble about thinking that we know the answer and therefore realizing that perhaps we can test the answer. Mm -hmm. Mike, you wanna weigh in as well? Yeah, so I had run an experiment in my MBA course, Max has done a version of this, and then we did a tweak to try to get at people's confidence about their own ideas. So we had people write these appeals to encourage someone to donate money, then we ran an experiment where we asked for the donations, but then we polled students on how they thought each different appeal would do. So looking across the however many 15 different groups to say, which one do you think is going to be most effective? So sorry, and, so the students themselves come up with different pitches to exactly. raise money, essentially. And, then, and, and then it's going to be a race to see which one actually is more effective out in the field. Exactly, yeah. Then we go, we ran this out in the field, we run the experiment, and then we give them the results. But before we give them the results, we have them rank how well um, everything will do. And a couple of things emerge. One is that there's some wisdom of the crowd. So I don't want to dismiss intuition altogether, but uh, there, there's a lot of noise in how people do, but every single group have put themselves in the top half of the class. Mm -hmm. So everybody thought there was gonna do, so there's massive overconfidence in terms of how they thought their own appeal would do. Is now, this even after they see the other appeals or is it? Yeah, so we had them, we walk, we had every group pr present all of the appeals and then had them rank every group. And um, so we did this and we just kind of saw um, striking, I guess, you know, some of this goes back to, you know, Max and Don's early JDM book, right? So this idea that, uh, that kind of overconfidence occurs in a lot of areas, but it's striking to see how pertinent it is here. And it's pertinent in a couple of ways, right? So you're coming into a situation and what, whether it's that you've gotten overconfident because you've spent time working on the idea or you just think your idea is kind of a priori going to be good. Um, what it does is it means that people are less likely to feel that they would even need to test it because there's a gap between how much you actually could gain from an experiment and how much you think you could gain. Because you may think this is already a pretty good idea. Um, an experiment may get me a little bit better but uh, not, not going to add that much value. So right. I, I do and, think and looking at that, that having humility to know your idea may not work as well as you think it will is pretty important. 
And I think one of the things the book does really well is, um, you know, for those who are thinking like, you know, how do I convince my boss to do this? It, giving them a copy of the book in itself is sort of inspiring because you see how many smart, experienced people, the, the examples you give of different companies and different uh, organizations, even uh, nonprofits and, and government related organizations uh, and institutions who make mistakes. Uh, again, not to Max's point, because they're not smarter, they don't know what they're doing in their day job. I mean, they're really effective, successful people. But even there, they find that the wealth of their experience is still just a, a subset of ideas that exist. And there's a lot of other ideas that just have gone non-tested because they didn't go around doing it. And I think it's a, a motivational book in, in, in that sense. Um, I, I do want to uh, get back to this issue of, uh, and, and you touched on it a little bit, uh, Mike and, and Max, you as well, when you talked about whether the lessons learned somewhere else, even in an experiment, whether or not they apply in your organization, in your context. So even if Google has proven, uh, whatever that might mean, that grades, grades don't matter, uh, I'm sure our students will be very happy to hear that and we'll try to convince us not to grade them, but whatever that might mean, even if there is some uh, reasonably well executed experiment that showed that result, whether that means you and this other company should not look at a grade point average or grades or, or any other metric before you hire seems a little bit of a stretch. And one of the things that the book does is it talks about sort of the mistakes that people make in uh, focusing too much on what and not digging deep enough into the why. And those of us who are in the negotiations world will be really familiar with this uh, sort of uh, the difference between what and why as well. If you're uh, affiliated with a program on negotiation, you've been to other events, you sort of know the, the distinction we often try to make between just settling with the what, like what somebody wants or what you found versus digging deeper and understanding the why. Can you talk a little bit about the what versus the why and how that can help you be a more um, sort of judicious consumer of experimental results and whether or not you need to run more experiments? I'm, I'll, I'm happy to get started, but Mike, if you're ready to go, I'll-, I'll Go ahead, why don't you start? Yeah. So, um, so, I, so there are lots of things that we know in life. Um, so in the US, um, we know that um, it's probably a good idea to drive on the right-hand side of the road rather than experimenting to find out is the right-hand side better or worse than the left-hand side for driving. Um, so there's things that we know, and the fact that it's Tuesday doesn't change the fact that we can kind of go with that. So, th and, and there are many things that, that from the social sciences that we know to be true. We know that defaults have an enormous impact on behavior. That's kind of a, a, a well-replicated result. And there are contexts where I would be very comfortable recommending the use of strategies in implementation without necessarily um, running a new experiment in a new context. But there are lots of, lots of situations where we have very limited evidence so far and I think that it might be a good idea in this new context. But if we're going to roll this out countrywide, affecting thousands of, thousands of employees and millions of customers, then I, then I clearly think that an experiment should be under significant consideration. And I would add that we are, we're overconfident in how much we know. So Don Moore, our colleague at, at Berkeley, just wrote a book, Perfectly Confident, and he documents that um, we, ha we have kind of this dramatic overconfidence in what we think we know. And for me, that implies that at the margin, when you are uncertain about what you know, it calls out for thinking with a more experiment, uh, moving toward a more experimental mindset um, rather than less. Um, so that we want to be cautious about what we know before we were using the word humble. Um, so we can talk about being more humble. We can talk about reducing our confidence um, uh, when, we, when we know we have a propensity to be overconfident. But basically, we want to make better calibrated judgments. Um, and, and for most of us, that would mean more experimentation rather than less. Mm -hmm. Mike, so, do you want to add something before we... Yeah. So, so I would also just kind of say on this, what versus why, it's an interesting distinction, right? You're going to come into yeah. an organization and say, here's a thing I want to roll out. Should I just experimentally test that thing exactly how it is? And I think that's a tempting 
thing to do. Uh, but I think that you're missing a lot of learning if you're not trying to also think about why something works, which would allow you to refine it and, and take that learning and bring it over to different parts of the organizations. In fact, you know, it, it's not just more versus less experimentation, it's getting the right types of experimentation. So I've seen uh, experiment heavy companies actually say, maybe we're just doing too many plain test. And I think that's right. Like that there are times where they're just saying, Hey, we could test everything. We don't need to have theories anymore. We don't need hypotheses. We don't need to figure out what's a broader lesson we're learning. But then they realize that they're just missing all the insight they could get about how to adapt, how to refine products, how to build up toward like a deeper set of frameworks internally, almost the way that research does kind of for the research community, but doing that within your company. So uh, Uber is a good example of a company that's gone uh, in the direction of trying to have a tighter set of uh, questions that they're answering and understanding, okay, we're gonna roll out Uber Express Pool. Let's figure out what are the things that would make it more or less appealing? Why are people reacting the way they are rather than just testing the product as is, although they do that as well. And once you have this why mindset, it also opens up other types of experiments that, that some people refer to as mechanism experiments, trying to not necessarily test a product as is, but test a hypothesis or a factor that might drive someone to behave in a certain way. I give one quick example on that. Uh, Microsoft was trying to figure out whether they should invest more in speeding up in speeding up Bing, right? So you kind of type in your search, you get your results back, but it's expensive to actually uh, do the thing that they uh, that would kind of speed up um, search results. So they wanted to know what the return was. And if you were just thinking in terms of evaluating the product you're rolling out, you would try some of these innovations, try to speed it up, and that would be costly in and of itself. And I saw a comment come in before about our experiments always costly. So they said, instead, what we really want to know is just how do people react to speed? We don't need to know the exact innovation. So they just slowed it down a little bit and experimentally mm -hmm. tested a slightly slower version and the, and the as is version. And that taught them everything they need to know about kind of why people react to, um, or how people might react to a new innovation without actually doing the innovation up front. And they ended up proceeding with it, but it was a much cheaper way to do it. it, it it's, I think that's a fantastic uh, example uh, because you're right. I mean, I saw the question I'd actually sort of jotted it down here as well. Somebody had asked this question about, well, you know, how do you convince somebody when it's expensive? And you just gave a, a, a brilliant example of a situation where uh, it, even what looks costly can maybe be done less costly, but in a very effective way. And these are the kinds of sort of nuggets and examples that are sort of strewn throughout the book, which I think when somebody reads it, they're like, oh my God, I could apply this kind of thinking or this kind of approach to deal with the kinds of problems that we thought were not quite addressable with experiments. So that's, that's kind of a really nice thing. Um, I want to move to some more of the questions and any sort of transition that's naturally and, and nicely there, Mike, to the questions from uh, the audience that have been coming in. And I apologize up front because, of course, we won't be able to get through all of them, but I, I have been trying to jot down some as they came along, especially those that were uh, still in the, in the sort of realm of the things we've been talking about broadly, but things that we haven't maybe touched on enough. And, and I want to start with something uh, that is about the topic of ethics. And the way the question was phrased was, um, you know, in a sense, in universities, we may have all these safeguards, uh, ethical protocols, et cetera. But when you get out into the wild, where there aren't institutions whose job is to make sure academics and others don't uh, do something unethical in their desire to experiment to achieve whatever ends they have, um, how do we deal with those ethical issues? Uh, should there be? Are there uh, limits to what people can do? How do we think the, about the ethicality of ethics running amok and people doing all sorts of bad stuff? Uh, as they're trying to make a buck or whatever it might be. To start with, um, if you're doing something unethical in one of the conditions of your experiment, you're being unethical. So well, I think we want to separate out engaging in unethical behavior in one of the conditions from the question of our experiments unethical. And, um, and, and we all we may have very different views. So Mike and I have run into in the Netherlands. We run into the fact that there's a common cultural notion that everybody should be treated the same. Well, experiments don't treat people the same. They randomly assign you to condition A or condition B, so you're not being treated the same. Um, I personally don't have much of a problem with that, and I think that in some cases, not running experiments would be the 
unethical behavior. So if we didn't run an experiment to find out whether a vaccine works or not, um, then that would be a significant problem. And if we think that we need to have good evidence on vaccines, um, I think we also want to have good evidence on employee happiness, on what reduces turnover, um, on what makes our organization more effective. So um, if, all, if what we're doing is trying out a new, new idea, we're doing it systematically and we're collecting data, um, I think that experiments are a tremendous tool for running a more ethical organization, um, but that doesn't eliminate the fact that if you have unethical behavior in one of the conditions, then it's unethical. So, the, so the, if we take any of the truly gruesome stories of experiments in history, where we quickly say that's unethical, the problem wasn't what, that it was an experiment. The problem was that there was um, unethical, terrible behavior going on in one of the conditions, one or more of the conditions. There is a dating app that changed their algorithm to, um, and they experimentally wanted to see whether saying you have a better match with somebody makes them feel like you had a better match or more likely to match. And um, they, <laughs> they tweaked the algorithm to have some people have almost an inflated match score with the person. Um, and they randomly tested that. And I think kind of to Max's point, I would separate, is it bad to test different versions of the product from, is it bad to deliberately inflate uh, somebody's match score with the goal of making them more likely to, um, to confront to match with somebody at the end, right? So uh, mm -hmm. I, I do think it's important to distinguish between is your concern about one of the conditions or is your concern about randomization? So, so uh, and I imagine something similar would happen in universities. We could sort of police ourselves, but we do have, you know, institutional review boards and such things. Do you get a sense that in companies, and it doesn't need to be a long lengthy answer, but is your sense that companies are thinking about these and making sure that people sort of uh, at the front lines who are designing these experiments or sort of filtering things through these kinds of ideas? Uh, is that sort of like a rare example? Or do you think that, you know what, if I was talking to an executive, I'd say, you know what, as you roll these things out, I want you to really pay a lot of attention to these things because in that moment, in that moment of decision, it just seems like a really creative, interesting, useful thing to test. And then you just don't have that ethical filter uh, all the time. In your experience, do you think we're kind of where we need to be or far from where we need to be on that? Um, so we're not where we need to be. There's certainly more that could be done. There's more that could be done just about curbing unethical behavior in general, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would say some of the efforts that I found to be compelling starting points have been companies that just start review boards so that when major experiments get launched, uh, they'll go and do something that's analogous to an IRB process um, in universities. Another approach that companies take that I found to be like a reasonable starting point is they'll put kind of guardrails. So have sets of metrics where it's like, if a certain thing is changing, you know, then, then, they'll, uh, then they'll escalate the experiment for more discussion before just rolling it out to everybody. And a variant of that is they'll have things that are just off limits. So even if an experiment shows that this new thing is gonna dramatically change uh, bookings at Airbnb or um, reservations at Yelp or Open Table, we're still not going to do it because we don't think it's the right thing to do. And red lines are just already in place. Yeah, so, so sort of trying, yeah, to, to flesh out a little bit what those are. But I do mm -hmm. think if you're just kind of are in the mindset of always trying different things, it is important just to have a clear sense of what those boundaries might be. Great. I want to get uh, to at least a couple more questions, but sorry, Max. Can, yeah, uh, yeah, I want to flip your question because there's a lot of people who are concerned about the eth ethics of experimentation. And I just want to highlight that I'm concerned about the ethics of non-experimentation. Okay, so I have already alluded to that in, with the drug analogy, but um, it's in experiments where we can find out what's going wrong in the world. So there's a lot of problems that are off kilter in the world. And I think experiments can help us find a path to solution. So I'm thinking of um, my, uh, we've already heard about Mike's um, experiment on Airbnb. Um, and basically Mike and his colleagues through an experiment highlight a societal problem that a, a large number of Airbnb hosts discriminate against, Afri against black Americans. Um, that's something that the company should have wanted to know before Mike got around to doing the experiment. And, and having a more experimental mindset can help you audit um, for 
what's going wrong in our organization and how can we fix it, rather than simply worrying about what harm might we do from experiments. So I want to continually harp on, if you don't think about the use of experiments, you could be making worse decisions and less ethical decisions as a result. No, I think that's a fantastic point, Max, and I appreciate you bringing that up and, and highlighting it here. Uh, the next question I want to ask is uh, something about uh, the complexity of the real world and the necessary simplicity of experimental designs. And often in the lab, what we're trying to do is isolate a certain factor, a certain mechanism. And of course, maybe you want to be doing that in the real world as well. But there was sort of this question about how do we balance the need to say something important that might change your approach or strategy or product offering? Uh, not just, you know, what color it should be, or should the price be X or Y? If you want to sort of think about bigger, more difficult decisions you need to make, can experiments weigh in on situations where the world is complex, but experimental designs necessarily need to be somewhat simple? Uh, or you can think of examples where people have made major difference, uh, or major changes uh, using experiments where uh, these things still mattered. Sure. Uh, so if we want to know... Um, how to get people to get their vaccine. Uh -huh. Well, there, there's yeah. lots of different answers. So can we do it in one experiment? No. Mm -hmm. So if we have a different problem in, an, in another organization of how do we get, um, uh, how do we get um, employees to show up on time? Or how do we keep students from um, cheating on their exam? Or pick, pick your topic. Um, there isn't going to be one simple experiment that can solve it. Um, on the other hand, um, let's imagine that you want to get some evidence of whether the task force who's making recommendations is heading up in the right direction. Could you take the whole bundle of things and see whether they collectively are moving us in the right direction or not and refining it later? I think that we can often um, do those kinds of broad scale tests um, to make sure that we're headed in the right direction, even in very, very complicated environments. Um, a, a story that, that I've told um, many times, but um, a very, very large insurance company um, through a consulting firm hired me um, to help redesign how 2,300 claims agents negotiated their claims. And um, I was very good at convincing the senior leadership that I had good strategies. And they basically said, let's go implement worldwide. And I said, well, why don't we first test it on a few thousand claims? And they said, no, we're convinced we want to implement. And, and so I, I was the one trying to slow down the enthusiasm for the ideas that I was presenting to them. Okay. But they simply wanted to believe that they were hearing the right answer and move forward on a widespread basis. So I think that there's lots of things we can do in complex, messy worlds um, to find out whether or not we're heading in the right direction and to develop a notion of continued testing. So when the British um, Behavioral Insight team in the UK figured out how to improve the tax letter, which was documented in a case at Mike wrote, um, they didn't then say, okay, time to quit. Rather, the tax bureau hired the lead investigator from the nudge unit and proceeded to create a staff of 50 people on how to continually improve the quality of their tax collection. And they clearly believed that they were getting a dramatic return on their investment by moving so strongly in the experimental direction. So how do you take a complex problem and figure out how to use an experimental mindset to continually learn over time. Fantastic. Mike, something to add? Yeah, so I guess building on that, it, there are two kind of broad approaches on that. And I think a little bit of what the question seemed to be getting at is almost like local optimization of things, right? So you kind of refine a product or refine a set of policies till you make it as good as it could be. Then this raises the question, well, what if it's not even the right product or the right policy? Are there bigger changes that you might want to make? Do you want to experiment with those? And I think that people sometimes over or 
underappreciate the extent to which experiments can be useful in those contexts too. Uh, just to give one example, uh, there's a nice experiment by Nick Bloom and collaborators where they were thinking about a question that Max raised before, which is, does consulting actually help people? <laughs> does it boost productivity? Now you could say, well, consulting is complicated. How do you figure out if uh, McKinsey or BCG or an Accenture goes in and works with an organization? They're doing a lot of stuff. Can you just uh, experimentally test that? Well, actually, Bloom and his collaborators decided, well, let's just test it. So they got a large, uh, so they got a set of uh, manufacturing plants in India and tracked their productivity before and after and randomly assigned consulting to some of them and didn't give consulting to other ones and found large boosts in productivity and profit for the ones that uh, raised or for the ones that got uh, consulting assigned to them. And it's created a huge literature that's not just been influential in research, but if you look at the World Bank, part of what they're doing is saying there's SMEs all around the world that we think could be high operating with higher productivity and higher profit and maybe missing some uh, key management practices. So they've run a series of follow-up experiments with kind of hundreds of millions of dollars thinking about what kind of consulting is it? Who do we bring in? How much bang can you get? Can you just pair businesses with each other? And when you think mm -hmm. about that, that's led an entire strategy for how to help boost productivity for SMEs around the globe. So it's hard to think about that as an example of local optimization. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, what I love about the, the, the two different kinds of answers, and there was a lot more going on here, but something that I'll just sort of point out for, uh, uh, for the crowd is at least the way I heard it was, you know, you have a whole bunch of stuff that might be going on. Like, how do you get people to take the vaccine? There might be 10 reasons people aren't taking the vaccine or 10 different reasons for 10 different people. How do you get people to pay their back taxes, et cetera? And you can identify one or two things that if you were to change those, you would get a boost. You might not solve all the problems, but you still get a huge boost in what you're doing. And then Mike, your example is to say, no, maybe we don't want to sort of narrowly focus on one aspect of consulting and see, does it help to have a first strategy meeting or does it help if it's three months? No, no, you just treat the entire thing and you just randomize who you're giving it to versus not giving it to. And you can worry about which aspect of consulting works or doesn't work later, but you're solving a huge problem very quickly with the experimental design. And I think that's kind of one of the nice things as you go through the book is there, there's so many of these pieces that, that sort of come out that you look at it and you say, well, oh my God, you know, that was what I was thinking is the reason I shouldn't do this or I won't bother, I can't convince somebody, but maybe I can. Here's an example of how people have done it and they've had similar problems of the kinds that I'm dealing with. I saw a comment already uh, coming through, it was, uh, it was from Vipul Ambani, which I had a student named Vipul Ambani and maybe, maybe you're that student uh, or maybe you're somebody who shares that name. Uh, but it, that this is a timely talk exactly because we're struggling with trying to convince somebody uh, in my organization. And maybe we're, well, instead of trying to convince them to do X, if we can just convince them to run the experiment, that might be a, a way station towards getting where we need to get. And so I want to ask the, the last question. And if, uh, hey, if it just says, hey, Vipal, how are you doing? Uh, so uh, the last question, we'll make it quick just because we're going to have to wrap very soon. Somebody asked a question about, do we need more of an experimental culture uh, in our organizations and in society? And I know people talk about this when it comes to entrepreneurship, that when the, the cost of failure is low, risk-taking goes up. And that's one of the things, you know, when you have bankruptcy laws that allow people not to go to debtor's prison, all of a sudden it's easier to, to run a business and, and try new things. Do you think that we need much more of that in organizations and in society? Uh, because when we say to people, you know, if you're more humble, if you're less confident, you're more likely to experiment. But people say, well, I get rewarded for being confident. So how do we think about that cultural baseline element? So it's an important issue. And I think that people do need to be willing to fail and organizations need to make that okay. If you're judging success just by having an idea and pushing the idea out irrespective of whether it works, they're gonna create one set of incentives, but by allowing people to have the humility to understand that their idea may not work and that the reward is for thinking carefully about trying to figure out whether or not it does, I think there could be big payoffs to that. And then sort of expanding on that, you wanna think about where are you, where do you want this failure? If you could bring it almost earlier in the innovation process, you could avoid a lot of big mistakes and then sort of be more confident downstream. Mm -hmm. All right, Max, I, I couldn't hear you. I don't know if uh, you don't look like you're on mute, but I don't hear you. Uh oh, okay. So, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, we can. Okay, yeah. um, I, I, I agree with Mike. So overall, I think we need, we need more organizations open to experiments. Um, and Mike already alluded earlier to the fact that there are organizations that are running a gazillion experiments and 
some of them could benefit by slowing down a little bit and thinking more about the theory, the ideas, what it is that they want to test rather than mm -hmm. simply moving to implementation so quick. But if you ask me, do we have more of a problem of under or over experimentation? The answer is undoubtedly under experimentation. Great. So uh, I'm going to wrap uh, with one last comment before I hand it over to Nicole. Uh, and the, the comment I was going to make is, you know, one of the things that this makes me think as we think about this discussion is, if I'm somebody in the audience, if I'm in an organization, one of the things I might do, and I don't get any royalties here, and yes, I'm biased because these people are my friends, but I'm also informed because I know what's the content of this book. I think if you give your team or people in your organization an opportunity to read what's in here and the examples that are there and use that as a basis for discussion, even an open-ended discussion, like can we use these tools? Where might we use these? How do we solve some of the problems we've been thinking about for a long time using this approach? I think you, a lot of the people in the audience might uh, go a long way in addressing some problems that otherwise might not have been addressed as well. And so uh, good luck to everybody in the audience. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Max and Mike and to PON and I'll hand it over to Nicole. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Deepak. And thanks to everyone for being here today. The recording of today's event will be on the PON website, um, hopefully later today, maybe early next week. So then in case you had to arrive late or wanted to share it with somebody else who wasn't able to see it, um, you'll be able to find it there. And I also wanted to let you know that we have a number of upcoming virtual trainings that are going on in the coming summer months. We do expect to start operating uh, at least one in-person uh, program in the fall, but you'll have to wait until November and probably until January 2022 for most things to come back in person uh, in Cambridge. In any way, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you to all of our speakers. Congratulations, Mike and Max, on the book. And we, uh, we so enjoyed having you here today. Thank you. All right. See you all soon. Bye-bye.